Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Jump On Air. We're so happy you're chosen to spend some of your Friday with us as we talk about statistics, science, data, and as always, jump. My name is Julian Paris. I'm the Learning Strategy Manager here at Jump Software, and I get to be your host for Jump On Air. We have a great show for you today, full of great speakers who are sharing their knowledge and sharing their passions with us. I'm going to show you the schedule right now, and as always, I'll bring back to the schedule or come back to the schedule during our transitions so you know just where we are in the program and what is coming next. Now remember, you can always come back if you have to disconnect. The link to remember is jump.com slash jump on air. And that'll reconnect you no matter what device you want to connect on. So put us on your iPad, take us on a run with your phone, whatever you want is jump.com slash jump on air. Now after the show, we hope you'll join us in the community to engage with our speakers, to give us show suggestions or episode comments, whatever you want. That URL is community.jump.com slash jump on air. And that's where you can watch past episodes and even watch past segments. And so we try to make those on-demand videos available just as quickly as we can, usually just the afternoon after a show airs. So again, that's community.jump.com slash jump on air. Now, I want to show you something about this community page because we're continuing to try to refine this to make the experience better for you. So there's a couple things we've done to make it easier to find past episodes, easier to find the segments you want, and interact with us. Now first, you'll look at the top. We actually have a ribbon now that has the past episodes. So you can look at the full episode program as well as watch the on-demand video. And so go to any of those pages if you also want to leave feedback on the particular episode. Also, there's a set of labels on the side. These are active labels. So when you click on one, for instance, you click on episode guide, you'll be shown just the full episode guides in the actual listing. Let's say you want to look at just the feature programs. Well, click the feature programs and you'll see just those in the listing. What's also nice is if you want to send a link to a colleague on just those programs, you can grab it from the URL. Those labels or folders actually change that URL so you can link directly to it. So take advantage of the community, community.jump.com slash jump on air. All right. So I always like to start off with a segment, and last time I gave us or gave you a science story. So I was talking about a bit of scientific research that uh, was really cutting edge and hopefully would be leading to something we can take advantage of in our life. But what I want to do today is a science story, but a different variety, and one that, oh, <laughs> I actually have some slides to tell you about these URLs. I'm sorry. We'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, just to remind you about the URL, jump.com, jump on air. That connects you to the live stream community.jump.com slash jump on air that connects you to the community and jump.com slash joa that's the schedule i realized i stuck that in last minute because we have a lot of urls i throw at you so i want you to recognize the difference between each of these connect with us to the live stream engage with us you know, the, <laughs> engage with us at the community and uh share the schedule or view the schedule okay so now what i was saying Last time I gave you some science that you couldn't use. This time I want to give you some science you can use in a section I'm calling Science Applied. So to get into this section, though, I have to tell you about a particular physiological metric that I actually care quite a bit about. Um, it may be one that you've never heard of, so I want to talk you through what it is. It's heart rate variability, which is actually uh, measured or classified as the root mean square of successive normal RR intervals. If you're not a cardiologist or have a passing interest in cardiology, or you're not a quantified self fitness person and collect all sorts of metrics on yourself, uh, you may not know what this is. So what I want to do before telling you about some applied science around it is take you through a really quick definition of what this is so you can appreciate what it measures. And to do that, I need to show you an EKG or an ECG trace. You've probably seen these on shows. They're the things that go bloop, bloop on a screen. Right. So let's actually add some nomenclature here that's used within the ECG literature. So the major deflection there is called an R or the R wave. And around it, there is the deflection downward, the Q and the S. Together, these are known as the QRS complex, and it reflects basically the electrical activity of the ventricles. So the depolarization of the ventricles. If you're interested in those other peak names, it's actually just P and the other one at the end is T. So P, Q, R, S, T. Not terribly inventive. The distance between the R and R's, those peaks of the ventricles, is known as the RR interval. Maybe not surprisingly, it is a distance in time between those peaks. So as your heart beats, there's some interval between them. Okay, so let's actually carry this trace out as if we're monitoring somebody's heart over a period of time. 
it might look something like this, those little blips happening in a regular interval. But what you hopefully will notice is that those RR intervals are not exactly the same. And this is actually a characteristic of a heart at rest. So when we're not running or really straining our sympathetic or sympathetic nervous system is not active, when we're just at rest, the intervals are not the same. And so if we were to line these up and actually count the milliseconds of these intervals, we would have a set of measurements for the RRs or for the RR intervals. Now, if we wanted to work on these, we could take them over to jump, right? We know how to work with jump. We'll stick them in a table. We can go to analyze distribution and we can look at the distribution of these RR intervals. Now, there's an average, right? That's 730 here. But importantly, there's a standard deviation. And the standard deviation, for those of you who remember the statistics, that's the root of a mean square of a variance. And that's all heart rate variability is. It's the standard deviation of those RR intervals. And it turns out that this is an important measure because more uh, functional autonomic nervous systems tend to have at rest higher heart rate variability. Or to quote Schaefer and Ginsburg in a paper I'll actually put in the community because it's open access, a healthy heart is not a metronome. The oscillations of a healthy heart are complex and constantly changing, which allows the cardiovascular system to rapidly adjust to sudden physical and psychological challenges to homeostasis. So, we want higher heart rate variability. And I mentioned this is a measure that I care a lot about because I have a device that actually can help me measure this. It collects my heart rate at about 200 hertz. And so it can actually calculate the RR intervals and actually give me a heart rate variability measure. So when I start to train for something, I like to look at past heart rate variability. This is going back about three months. And that line there is when I started training for a particularly long race. And so you can see if I add in the new heart rate variability measures, since I started training, I'm definitely peaking upwards. And it's a great measure of sort of cardiovascular health or specifically autonomic nervous system health. And it's one that's fairly sensitive to changes like this. Okay, so the science that you can apply is not that I think you should go start training for a marathon. It is something that you can probably do a little bit more easily and something I hope that you can apply in your daily life. And the science I wanna tell you about is actually a recent study that was in integrative medical research about the effects of yoga breathing on a heart rate variability. And they did this in healthy adolescents. And so they had a, a basically an intervention in a randomized control sense that worked to help these adolescents practice this yoga breathing technique. And what they observed after six months was actually increases in heart rate variability at rest. So they had actually benefited this autonomic nervous system feature. And so I wanna take you through quickly what it looked like. They had a start 730 people. They actually removed from the study people who were athletes or had previous experience with yoga, which left 520 people, which they randomly assigned to two groups, 260 in each. As is always the case with a long-term study, like six months, there's dropout or subject attrition. So they ended up with 236 in the experimental group and 242 in the experimental, or sorry, in the control, excuse me. So a pretty good sample size of individuals that they randomly assigned to this yoga breathing. They unfortunately only gave tables in the actual uh, journal article. I emailed the authors for the data, but they haven't gotten back to me yet. But we can see the root mean square of this, the NN or RR intervals in there. Uh, I actually put these data into jump. And if you know a little bit of the basic stats, you can calculate a confidence interval in standard air. I'll put this table in the community as well. But we have those values and I can actually show you the results in a graph. I'm sticking with the typical interaction plot style where we have lines. Um, but obviously we can't know the functional form between baseline and six months. But the real upshot here is that at six months, the yoga breathing group had a statistically significant increase in their heart rate variability, which is pretty cool for an intervention that just was a yoga breathing technique every morning. You don't have to go running. You can actually just sit and breathe in a particular way. Interestingly as well, there was a drop in their resting heart rate after six months by engaging in this particular yoga breathing technique. So some science you can apply right away. And so what we're actually gonna do after our next segment, I'm gonna invite RT Idell, who's a person here at Jump, but also a certified yoga instructor. And she's gonna take us through that yoga breathing technique actually in her new segment called Mindful Moments. So come back for us after the next segment and you can learn too how to apply this science. All right, so we have a great schedule for you today. I wanna to kick it over to our first featured presenter, Dan Valenti, who's going to take us through some of his own data and a talk entitled End to End Analytics, a case study in analyzing home power data. Hi, 
Hi there, um, I'm Dan Valenti. I'm the manager of Jump Product Management at Jump. And uh, as a product manager, um, my team and I work on um, listening to customers and getting new features in the product. So you, you may have talked to me about um, ways that you're using Jump now and how you'd like to use it uh, better in the future. So we're always thinking about um, developing uh, new ways of using Jump. Um, and like Julian is interested in, in quantified self and tracking um, metrics about uh, things that are going on in the body. I'm I'm very interested in kind of the the home uh, home tracking. So in the IoT space. So uh, I've been I've been looking at different measures in my house and and working on home automation and trying to improve uh, the efficiency of my my home over the last couple of years. So what I'd like to do is is talk about one specific area where we've been um, where I've been interested in, which is which is the home power utilization. So. And I, I think this is a good example because it is something that, that uh, touches every aspect of how you can use Jump for an analysis flow. So it, I, when I think about working on any new data analysis project, there are typically four steps. There's accessing data. So you've got data that's coming from, from some place. If you're not uh, running a design experiment and creating data and putting it into Jump, you're probably pulling data from somewhere um, so you need to get up the data. Um, it's rarely clean. So there's going to be some data preparation step that's going to be involved in the project. Uh, using Jump is, is great. It's visual. You can create graphs and explore the data, find trends and patterns in those data. And then ultimately, when you, when you build some graphs that you want to share or build some models that explain what's going on, we want to be able to communicate that uh, with others. And we'll show you uh, a new way um, that we've been working on for communicating uh, results, discoveries, and jump with uh, with Jump Live and in Jump Public. I also would like to talk about a couple of features that were added in Jump 15, which was the most recent version of Jump, that helps users stay in the analysis flow. And um, when we're done with this exploration, we're going to go ahead and, and publish our results to uh, Jump Public, which is the public version of Jump Live, the newest product in the Jump family of products. And what that lets us do is share the results with others that don't have Jump. So as I said, I'm going to use an example from the IoT sensor streaming space, specifically monitoring home power utilization data. And I think this data set's pretty interesting because it includes um, some challenges that we had around enriching the data, taking the raw data, creating some features, um, transforming it, and then modeling it in a way that, uh, that we can discover what's going on. So um, I mentioned end-to-end -end analytic workflow. Uh, I like to show this slide a lot. Um, this is really how we see Jump fitting into kind of this this end-to-end -end analytic workflow. So as I said, you've got to have data that comes from somewhere. So no matter where your data exists, whether it's in um, flat text files, CSV, Excel, uh, PDF, databases, um, Jump can get at it. Uh, so you, you get the data in from somewhere, and then um, within here, you kind of step through the, the process. So we access the data. We often need to do some shaping and pre-processing, so we can talk about that. Visualizing what's going on in the data, building some models, organization of what you find, and then ultimately sharing the results. And, and there's numerous ways to, sh to share results. We, we have things like interactive HTML, saving high-resolution um, graphs in for publications, generating PowerPoint slides, and, and our most recent way of sharing and communicating results, which is Jump Public and Jump Live. Okay, so let's let's take a few steps back. Um, how did this journey start? So, in 2012, when I when I moved into my home, um, I was interested in collecting the the instantaneous utilization of power that my home was using. So this is a, this is a photograph of the, um, the main breaker box that goes into my home. This is where the service comes in. Here's the, the main shutoff here. And this, this box that is outlined in red is a device that's made by Nurio. And what it has is, is a, a couple of current taps here that you see around uh, the main um, inlets to the, the circuit breaker and sub panel in the house. And what that does is measure how much 
power utilization is, is occurring. Now, um, this, is, this was in 2012. This is before, um, at least in North Carolina, the power company here was installing smart meters on, on, the, um, on the homes. So if you didn't have a device like this, you, you, uh, there was no way to really get that, that granular data. So that's, uh, and I, I've been collecting data since then. And I, I think it's a, a pretty interesting um, measure that you can look at because unlike, unlike the um, you know, individual energy measurements at the device level, the, the analog signal that's coming in, the power signal really reveals a lot about what's going on in the home. So whenever I start an analysis project, I think it's important to think about questions. So what, what are the types of questions that I was trying to answer with these data? So I was brainstorming and, and just kind of came up with, with these four. So um, are there months of the year where more energy is being used? Just looking over the course of the whole month, are there, are there certain months that are, are uh, where we're, where we're gener uh, using more energy in the home than others? Um, we'd, I'd like to look at year over year changes. As I mentioned, I, I was doing things in my home after we moved in to try to optimize our energy, energy utilization. And um, one way to do that is to just look at cumulative sums over time where you can see the growth of utilization over the year and then compare year over year data. Um, we're not quite done with this year. We're, we're four months into this year. So could we use some of our historical data to forecast the remainder of the year? So doing some time series forecasting there. I'd, I'd like to see if we could do that as well. And then finally, can we arrange the graphs together that answer the following three questions into a single dashboard for easy communication of the data and trends with others? So let's, let's see where we ended up. Um, I'm gonna, open the dashboard on Jump Public. This is Jump Public, the, uh, the public version of Jump Live. And we can see our power meter dashboard that's uh, in this website here. So this is no longer in Jump, we're just in a web browser. Um, and then if I click on this report, you can see that, uh, that photo of the power meter that's installed in the house again. And if we go to the dashboard that we'll create, you can see we've got our, our cumulative sum plots. Here's our utilization over, over the last um, eight years, uh, our partial year for 2020, obviously. Here's our, our monthly utilization that's got a, an error bar that, that looks across a different year. And we also have a tabulate report here. And because this is running on Jump Public, uh, I, can, I can use the exploratory data analysis tools like the local data filter um, and just focus on uh, some, some recent years. Now, um, if you notice this dashboard is re being re regenerated based on my data filter selection. When I'm just looking at one year, I don't get error bars on my, on my graph here, but as soon as I add in additional years, we start to get those, those uh, recalculation of the error bars. So this is a nice way to explore the data um, right from a web browser and jump public. And then the final view that we'll, we'll uh, focus on creating as we start from the beginning again is this time series forecast. So another exploratory data analysis tool that's, that's um, quite useful in Jump is the column switcher. It lets us move across different columns. And now I have two different metrics that I'm interested in. We're forecasting the, the total cumulative utilization for the year. This is forecasting out to the end of the year. And then we can, we can also do the column switch and do a, a forecast for just our monthly utilization. So we've got kind of the, the end. This is where we want to end up. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the workflow and see um, if we can get there. All right. Uh, so the, for, this, for this analysis, we're actually going to use the, um, the monthly data. I'll open up the, the raw power data because I think it's interesting. Um, so this is the instantaneous power data. And when I was saying it was an analog signal, um, it's, it's quite interesting from a signal processing standpoint to look at. So here's our timestamp of all of, this is one month of data that we're looking at. And then if we look at the utilization and we can just turn on the line plot here, um, what, this, what this signal looks like is it's a rectified, it's a rectified signal, so it's only power uh, positive, and it's got a DC offset. So um, as much as you try to remove and turn off everything in the house, it's still gonna use a baseline set of energy, and that's kind of the always on level. Um, for this house, I was able to get it down to about 200, 
watts always on. Um, but what you can start to do is, is analyze these data in an interesting way and you can use techniques like the Functional Data Explorer um, to, to really find different patterns and trends. So um, I'm just teasing this as a, a, a potential follow-up to this segment where we look more closely at the, the individual data. But for this, um, we're going to focus on, on the, the monthly utilization data. So the Nurio website lets you download your historical data. It comes in as a CSV file. Um, Jump can easily open CSV files. And now we have um, our, our raw data here and we have the, the month of the year um, that we've got the, the utility bill uh, mailed. And then we also have our utilization that I pulled from Nereo from the month. Now, this data set is, is not going to be all of the things that we need in order to create that dashboard that we saw at the beginning. So um, we'll have to go into step two, which is let's prepare this, uh, these data for analysis. We'll have to do some transforms and create some features. So the things that we're going to need to create that dashboard involve creating some time rollups um, and then also taking this monthly utilization and turning it into our cumulative sums over the year. Now, um, right from the data table, you've got a lot of ways to do very useful um, feature creation from a right click. So if I right click on the top of the column, there is a, an option to create a new formula column. And what this will let me do is create all of the, the, the rollups and the derived columns that I need. Um, so to do that cumulative sum, I'm gonna need our year. So if I go to the date time, I can click on year. And what Jump will do is it'll create a new column for me. And um, it actually generates the formula for me in that new column. So it's not, uh, it's, it's actually something that I can take and I can edit if need be. So we've got our, our, our year. Um, the other thing that we're gonna need is our, our month, uh, the abbreviated version of the month, because that looks better on the graph. So now we have our abbreviated version of the month. We can also create our, our regular month just in um, one through 12. And, and then, um, so now we have the, the, the granular parts of the date that we need in order to do our, our, uh, our new derived formula, which is that cumulative sum. Now, one interesting and, and slightly uh, hidden feature of the new formula column is the ability to do a group by in a column. So as I said, I was interested in doing cumulative sums by year. So if I first click on this year and then right at the bottom here, there's a group by, and now this year will be turned into a grouping variable that I could use to then perform another operation on my metric of interest, which is our kilowatt usage. So now if you see, if we go to the new formula column again, I jump lets me know that it's grouping by the year, and now it's easy enough to go to the row, cumulative sum, and now I have my second, second response that I'm interested in, and you notice, it's adding up all of the power utilization for the year. And once it rolls over to 2013 and so on, it, it, uh, it starts again. So without having to write any scripting or go into the formula editor, we've been able to take that raw data and transform it into what we need to build the graphs to communicate what's in these data. All right, so I'm happy with, with our columns here. And now it's time to, to build up the components of, the, of that um, dashboard and then also that, that time series forecast. So let's start on the, let's start on the components. Let's um, first start with the cumulative sum plot that was, our, that was our main graph. So to do that, we'll go into the graph builder. And again, we're, we are looking at um, the, the cumulative sum of the utilization and uh, we're interested in the, the month of the year. Now we've got all of our, our, uh, our data points there. We can use um, the year as an overlay. And then I will change from, from points to, to our, our line. And now we've got, our, now we've got our, our years and then our cumulative sum here. If I wanna add the points back in, I can drag and drop um, and then make these points into a mean so they line up with the lines. So that's all it takes to make the, the cumulative sum plot. That's the one component of our dashboard that we're, gonna, that we're gonna use to build up. 
Now the next thing we're going to do is that monthly bar chart. So again, we'll go into Graph Builder and, and we'll do our, our month. And here we're just going to look at our, our utilization. Um, so not the, not the sum. I'll change these points to bars and then I'll add a standard deviation for our error bar. And that one is now done and ready to go. And also in our dashboard, we had a, a tabular view of the same data, just if, if the consumers of those reports want to, uh, of this dashboard wants to see that. So what I'll do is go into tabulate and I'll, I'll generate the same version of that. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll use our year and let me just convert that to nominal. So we use our year um, and then again, we'll, grab our, our utilization. We'll use this twice. Um, what I wanna do is change this guy to the mean, and then we'll add in our um, standard deviation. So I'm happy with that uh, plot. So now we have got the three components of our dashboard that we're gonna go ahead and publish and share. Now the, the other view that we had was that, that time series forecast. And this is the, um, the new feature that's in Jump 15 that helps you stay um, more in the flow. So you can do time series forecasts right from Graph Builder now. So I will do the same thing. We'll start with our, with our utilization. Um, and, uh, and then we'll do our, our, our whole series here. So we'll connect these lines. So here's the time series that we want to be able to forecast. Um, in order to instantiate the, the time series forecast within Graph Builder, what we first have to do is turn on the line of fit element. That doesn't look very much like a time series forecast, but if we change the fit from our default polynomial to time series, now we get that, that time series forecast there. We will want to change the seasonal periods to 12 because this is cyclical data that's occurring on a yearly basis. And let's forecast out a year past what we have for our data. Now in our, our dashboard that we published, we also were looking at not just the, the kilowatt usage, but also the cumulative sum. So for that, I will bring up one of our column switchers and then grab our usage and then switch that out with our two responses. All right, so now we have all of the components ready um, for our, the graph that we want to publish. Now, instead of publishing these three graphs independently, we want to arrange those into a single dashboard. So for that, I'll go to the dashboard builder and I'll pick one of our default templates to assemble our dashboard. That's what we had on our, on our final version is we had our cumulative sum plot first. And then we had a tabbed view of our monthly utilization. And then the trick with getting a tab here in the graph builder is if you go to the upper right corner, then it will, the dashboard builder will tab those two reports. Then finally, we will add a local data filter because we had that capability to just look at different um, years and have that propagate to all of the components of the dashboard builder. So add that local data filter in and then um, we will run this dashboard and add in year for our filter. And then we'll be able to publish these results to, to jump public. So as soon as this is done, we'll, uh, we'll take these components and we will go ahead and publish. There we go. And in our year, and now we're ready to go. So we've got this dashboard that we want, and then also our time series forecast, which is Graph Builder 3. To now publish and share these on Jump Public, we'll go to File, Publish. And then I'll grab my dashboard and my Graph Builder 3, and then I'll publish this to Jump Public. This will allow me to configure the report. 
Um, here's the, and give it a title. And here's our dashboard and then the time series forecast. I'll give these some descriptions if I want. And then while I'm testing to make sure this all looks good, uh, I can choose who I want to share it with. In this case, I just want myself to look at it. So I'm going to pick only me and then we will publish this report. And it'll, it'll grab um, the data table and the reports that we have, wrap them up into a package and then publish them to jump public. And, and here we are, here's our, our two views that we had um, minus the power meter dashboard picture. As you can see, that dashboard looks just like we had from the start, and our local data filter is operational, just like the, uh, the last version there. Okay, so now this is power data, so it's, it's gonna be coming in every month, and as much as I'd like to interactively do this and generate all of these graphs every time I have new data coming in, what I'd, like to be able to do is, is automate this, right? So um, one thing that we can do is, is as new data comes in, we can have a, we can generate a script that lets us publish the updated version of, uh, of this dashboard to, to jump public as soon as there's a new report. And again, the, the, the whole, uh, the way this is scripted is kind of outside the scope of this um, talk, but we can, we can certainly revisit that in another date, but, the idea here is that with um, a single run of the script, it will pull the new data, it will generate the standard graphs and reports that we have for that, and then it'll push out and replace in the process the, uh, the dashboard that, uh, that we wanna monitor so we can make sure that we're able to, to look at that on a regular basis. And now that's done, it's published. You can see this is a different view. Um, as you can see, it's updated a few seconds ago. And um, we've got that, that additional uh, photo of the power meter that, uh, that we have installed. So that is a quick example of how you can use Jump from getting at data to cleaning it up, um, creating a set of visuals that, that uh, show what's in the data, fitting some models with the time series forecast, assembling those all into a dashboard for a single view into what's going on in the data set, and then quickly publishing those results to, to jump public to share with those that don't have jump. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dan. That was super informative. Um, I know for a fact, Dan also collects data on himself uh, for personal fitness. So uh, it's not just something I do. And you should actually interact with uh, Dan on the community. He can maybe point you over to some of his additional data. He uh, insulated his attic once and collected lots of data there as well. So Dan has definitely uh, done a lot of this and it's worth looking at what he's done to see if you can do it yourself. So our next segment I'm really excited about and I mentioned right at the start, we're having Artie Maidel, uh, who is one of our Jump employees, but also a certified yoga teacher to take us through that yoga breathing that I talked about in the intro. And so this is our first installment of Mindful Moment. Hey everybody, my name is Arthi and this is your Mindful Moment. Um, so Julian in his intro talked about this breathing technique called Brahmari breathing. It's a yoga breathing technique and I'm gonna take you through that in a little bit. But first I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what mindfulness is. So mindfulness, the way I think about it is um, paying attention to the present moment on purpose without judgment. So this breathing technique that we're gonna do is gonna enable you to have a little bit of that mindfulness today. So, um, what is this breathing technique all about? It's um, called Brahmari breathing and also known as bumblebee or bee breathing. You may have done it in a yoga class if you take yoga. And what it does is it brings your attention, your awareness inward. And it's also supposed to bring a sense of calm and relaxation. So it's very simple, it's very fun. What makes it different uh, compared to other breathing techniques that you may know of is that you make a humming 
uh, sound, a B breath, a, a, a B sound as you are um, exhaling. So we'll give it a try. Um, here's how you do it. You're gonna come forward on your seat if you're seated, or you can do this standing if you like. And if you're seated, have your feet on the floor, flat on the floor. You're gonna relax your shoulders down. Have a little smile on your face, relax your jaw, and take a deep breath in through the nose, and then exhale with a humming sound. The bottom of the exhale, you'll pull your belly in a little bit toward the spine, and that'll help you to get all that exhale out. So pretty easy, right? So we'll give it a try. We're gonna do it five times together. And then what I'll encourage you to do um, in this paying attention um, on purpose without judgment is to uh, pay attention to the vibration that you feel. So as you're doing the humming sound, you're gonna feel some vibration possibly in your head, lips, teeth, jaw, maybe in the chest. So just notice what's happening and where you feel this vibration. So come forward on your chair, have a long spine here. Your head is reaching, crown of your head is reaching toward the ceiling. Relax the shoulders down, relax your jaw. Your hands can rest onto your lap and take a deep breath in. You can close your eyes and exhale with a hum. Inhaling and exhaling. Remember to try varying your pitch if you like. Inhale and exhale. Noticing those vibrations on the exhale. Inhaling and exhaling. Last time, inhale and exhale. You can keep your eyes closed for the moment if you like and just listen. And just notice how you feel. Bring some awareness to your chest. Your attention to the top of the head. Notice the bottom of your feet. And see if you can sense your fingertips. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Now the study that Julian mentioned in his intro had one more element to the Brahmari breathing, and that is to, to close the ears. So if you wanna try this, um, we'll do this a couple of times. So you bring your arms out and then bend at the elbows and bring your index fingers in toward your ears. And you'll just close this, this cartilage flap by your ear. And the advantage of this is that it, it broadens your chest and it helps with the breathing. And it also helps you to uh, bring your attention inward again. So do the same exact thing with your ears closed. And you can just do that on your own breath at your own time. And I will do it, we'll do it twice together. Mm. Mm. your eyes closed, open your eyes, 
Relax the arms down. And this has been your mindful moment. Thanks for joining me. Stay curious and be present and see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you so much, RT. Uh, I can look forward to our next mindful moment. We'll have them next week and we hope everyone will join us for that. Our next segment is the data doctor who's back to tell us more things we can do with jump to fix our common problems. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's segment. And what we are going to do today is talk about a few techniques that can help us clean up data more efficiently. Uh, data cleanup is something that is painful in many instances, but uh, we, can, we can certainly help things if we know a few tips and tricks. And, and these are all built into Jump, what we're doing today. That was part of my goal for today's show is, uh, you know, those of you that know me know that I like to script things when I uh, have a problem that needs solved again and again. But for today's show, we're not going to use any scripts. We're not going to write any formulas. We're just going to see how much we can do with things that are built into Jump. So let's get started. And, um, you know, you can see here what the topics we'll cover today. And I think we're going to hopefully do some things that uh, you may know they were even in Jump, but you didn't maybe think to use them the way we're going to use them today. So let's jump right in here. First of all, let's take a look at this data table. It's been post pasted in from somewhere. And we've got a lot of missing uh, cells, or the cells aren't missing, but the data is. And so you can see, for example, that these counties need to span down several cells. And the states are the same way. It's a long table, so it's hard to see that. But we, we've got to span those down. And the same with these metrics. So the first thing I want to talk about is the different ways that Jump can fill in data so that you don't have to cut and paste. So let's just run through those real quickly in case you don't know about any of these. OK, first of all. Uh, if I select a single cell and right click, I have the option to fill that to the end of the table or, or to some row of my choosing. And if I pick a row that's too high for the given data table, then jump extends the data table to accommodate that request. If we select more than one cell at a time, then jump does a couple things. If it um, can figure out a pattern to the data, if that's numeric data, then it might uh, offer us, well, it will offer us to the ability to continue that sequence to the end of the table or to another row. So here, let me do that. And you can see the jump has figured out what that sequence was. It figured out it's an arithmetic sequence. I'm adding one each time. And here I've got a geometric sequence. And if I do the same thing, you can see the jump figures out we're multiplying by three from one row to the next. Now, if I've got categorical data, like you see at the end, um, you know, you, there's no mathematics behind that. So my choices are to fill to the end of the table or fill to a given row. And what will happen is it'll just repeat that sequence over and over. And sometimes we want to do that with numbers. And that's fine, too. If I had just selected these cells and decided I would repeat the sequence, uh, I'm going to do it to the end of the table, actually. <laughs> This goes one, two, three, one, two, three, and so forth. Finally, jump, and, and this is something I think maybe not everyone knows about. Um, if I highlight cells where I've got gaps in between data, then my option here is to replace the missing values with whatever is above them. So here I'll select, and you'll notice that those A's, B's, and C's have gotten filled in. And so that's very useful and something we'll use in that table we saw before. And this works with numbers as well. And notice in that first column, column four, I, I did not go to the end of the table. So this only happens wherever you select. So if you want to do this all the way down to the bottom of the table, select the whole column and then do this. Okay, so just a quick review of, of the ways that Jump can fill in data so that you don't have to copy and paste. Let's, let's go to our data set. So it's pretty clear what we have to do here. And this is going to be pretty easy. We're going to select the state. And I, I want to point this out. If you right click on the column header, then you get all these column options. That's not what you're after. You need to click in the data that you've selected. And that's where that fill command will show up. So we're going to replace the missings with the previous values for the states and counties. 
And then these metrics were just gonna repeat over and over again because we were lucky enough in this data set that every county has four rows of data, births, deaths, the net international migration and the net domestic migration. So we can just come here, right click and fill to the end of the table and we're done. Okay, we can leave the data like this. We could split it out using this column. That's a lot of times why we wanna do this is so we can split the data out into a wider format, uh, but we're ready to go. So that's a really easy example that would not have been fun with copy and paste, but it's easy with the built-in tools we have. Let's go to our next example. And this is going to involve a little bit of cleanup where, and this is, I'm sure this has happened to you before, you've, you've pasted in data or maybe you've, you've tried to do an import, but there's been so many header rows that things didn't work out the way you wanted. And so what ends up happening is you have a header row in the first row or, or some other early row of jump, and really you want those to be column names. The easiest way to make that happen is to select that whole row and you're just gonna copy it. Okay, now you won't see it from a right click, so you're gonna use your edit menu or you're just gonna do a control C or command C on a Mac. Then you're gonna come over here to the left and just select all these columns. And you can do that with a control A if you need to. And then we'll control V, we'll paste. And immediately all those names go in the columns just like you wanted. Okay, now our, our columns are named appropriately. So that's, that's the first thing is just a quick cut and paste of these column names, it saves a lot of time. Now the next thing is I'm gonna show something that a lot of you have seen before. Um, and that is when I right click on a selected cell, I can select the cells that match that cell. So here I've got a negative four in this column and I can select all the rows in the column that have a negative four. And that's with a right click. What you may not know is that if I do this for a pair of columns, a pair of values in the same row, and they don't have to be adjacent, I don't see that menu option here. So you might not know that it exists. It still exists. You gotta come to the left here in the uh, selection bar for that row, and then you can select matching cells. And if you look down below in the lower left of the table, you can see only three rows in the data set have this criteria. But the point is you can do it. And we'll, we'll take a look at this later. It also works for multiple selections. So if I, if I select a one, two, three, or four, and I select the matching cells, then I go through the whole table and select anywhere that I see a one, a two, or three, or a four in that, in that uh, column. So how does that help us here? Well, if you look at this data, we've got this header information repeated every so often. And, but the thing is, it's the same, it's the same values. It's the same you know, corruption, if you will. So I'm just going to take this, this whole row, select it and right click and select the matching cells. And you can see that that is selected 10 rows. I'll just delete them. And boom, we're, we're ready to go. Now we have to clean up a little bit. You can see that by the left justification, these columns are actually being stored as characters and so are these. Uh, but you're gonna see a cool technique later today with um, Peter and Mary called, um, or I won't go through the whole thing, but I'll show you where to see it. It's called standardized attributes. If I right click and click on standardized attributes, this lets me change attributes for all six of those columns at once. So real time saver. So I could make those numeric very easily. All right, so next, we're going to use this select matching cells. We're gonna use these last three bullets in a, in a more complicated example. So let's, let's pull that up and take a look. Now this data has been pasted in from a website. I'll show you how I got this. This really happened to me. <laughs> it was not fun. So I went to our discovery website and I, we've got, uh, let me go to the abstracts here. So we've got papers and different information about them, the authors and you know, everything else. And I just copied this whole page and pasted it into Jump. And so what I got was something that looked like this. And the issue is, of course, that everything's in a single column and I don't want it to look like that. How I want it to look, I'll just run this script here. This is what I want. 
I want every paper on its own line and things broken out by session, topic, title, authors, level, and abstract. So this would be easy with the tricks we've learned today, except for one thing. And the one thing is that some papers have two authors, some papers have one author, some papers have more authors, four or five or six authors, and that's what's gonna keep us from using the trick that we used here, where I could just say, look, I, I know the five things that I have for every paper, and I'm just gonna copy those over and over and over again. It's not gonna work like that for us because we don't always have the same number of things. So what can we do about that? Well, there's a lot of things you can do about that. You saw my script, um, you know, that does it instantly, but you have to write a script. And if you use formula columns, uh, you might have to write formulas. So how can we do that with, with none of those things? Let's take a look. First of all, let's select all the blank cells with select matching cells and delete those rows. We're also going to delete the rows where we have, you know, non-useful information. So that's some of these first few rows. And then at the bottom of the table, we've got the same thing going on. So let's get rid of those. We'll just highlight all those rows and get rid of them. So that's kind of first step. Okay, next step, I'm gonna delete column two here. We don't need that column. And we're going to, uh, I'll pass this through a quick recode where I'm just going to collapse the white space. Let's get rid of redundant white spaces and we'll just do this in place. We don't need a, we don't need a, a new column for this. Once that's done, go ahead and hit okay, or recode rather. Now, let's take a look at papers. How do we know that we've got a paper? Well, if you, if you take a look at the first uh, line in this data table, you'll see the word session, okay, session ID. And this, this is how you set off papers. There's a, there's a paper, there's a paper, there's another paper. And how can I flag this? Well, the, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna do a control find, control F, and I'm gonna change session ID to session underscore ID. And I do that for, for two reasons. One, it lets me double check. You saw it's made 44 replacements. I can see that, yeah, I had 44 papers, so that, that makes me happy. But secondly, I've created a word here now that is unusual. It's not something I'm likely to find if I, if I search the text of an abstract. You might find the word session, but you're not gonna find session underscore ID. So it, it helps make that unique. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do another recode, but this time we will allow the new formula to be made and we're going to say, or the new column rather, I want the first word. I just want the first word out of every line. And what's that do for us? Now I can see wherever session ID is and we're gonna use a cool copy and paste with a flagging technique to set off all the papers and group them together so that we don't mix up the contents for each paper. And here's how we'll do it. We'll create a new column with a double click and we'll use the fill technique we had earlier to fill this column with zeros. Then what we'll do is we'll change that first entry to a one. That's our flag, that's flagging the beginning of a paper. I'm gonna control C, I'm gonna copy that into my buffer. And then when I go to select matching cells in this session ID column or the, you know, the second column we created, watch what happens when I move around. Those rows are still selected. And because of that, I can just paste into this last column I had. So now I've got a flag and it's a numeric flag. I could here accomplish what I want to accomplish next. What I want to accomplish next is use these flags with a new formula column. A, uh, it's in the row section here and we're gonna do a cumulative sum and watch what happens here. Let's look at that first paper. My cumulative one uh, sum starts at one and then I keep adding zeros so it doesn't change until it gets to that second paper. And it keeps changing only when I find a new paper. So what's nice about this is I'm gonna remove that formula and this is now, this is a grouping column. This is now something I can use, I'll just call it paper, to group my papers and make sure that the information for each paper stays together. And I'm gonna need this as a grouping column when I split out later because papers have different numbers of rows. Now the next thing I can do also with this, uh, this idea of a cumulative sum, this might be counterintuitive. I'm gonna change all these entries to one by filling to the end of the table. And then I'm gonna group on paper. So I'm gonna right click, go to the new formula column and group by that. 
Now what starts to happen is when we do a cumulative sum on these ones. Oops. I get, I get counting, right? Because I'm accumulating ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it starts over. At, the, at, at each paper, the, the counting starts again. Why is that nice? Let's take a look at one and two and select the matching cells. Notice that's always the session ID of the paper. It's always the title of the paper. Now, I wish that this happened everywhere, but it starts to break down for author because here's two authors. And so I've got the numbers three and four, but I only have one author in the next paper. So I just get the number three. So the bottom line of this is the last three sections or three rows of each paper's data. The last three rows are always topic level and industry, but they don't always necessarily equal five, six, seven. They're gonna equal maybe four, five, six, or nine, 10, 11. So how do we deal with that? Let's do another formula column. And we'll do this now with the distributional section and do a rank in reverse. And so now look what this has done. This is allowing us to, to count backwards. We're, we're counting those same numbers, one through seven for that first paper, but now they're in reverse. Why this works is, is, is now if I select a one, two, three in this column, I do always get those last three parts. I always get the topic, the level, the industry. And this is exactly what's needed. So I'm gonna break these down by taking out the formulas so that they don't change as I change data here and watch what we can do. Okay, I don't even, I don't need this column anymore. In fact, I don't need this column anymore. Okay, what do I need to do? I need to make sure that these five sixes and sevens actually turn into high values now everywhere. The last three lines in the data, I want to be high values. I don't want the authors to be able to collide as this goes three, four, five, six, seven authors. So I'm just going to be lazy and type 50, 60, 70. I know I'm not going to have 40 something authors anywhere. Now, again, we'll use a, a tricky form of this copy paste. Very convenient here. I'm going to copy these three things into the buffer, come to this column with the three, two, one, and right click, select the matching cells. Now I've got the last three rows of every table. When I come back over here, I'm going to paste these with a control V and now look what's happened. I've got one, two, which we know are the session and the title. I've got 50, 60, 70, which I know is a topic level in industry. And starting at three, I count as high as I need to, to get all the authors. Might go to four, might go to 12, I mean, who knows? The point is, I can now split this table. So let's do it. We'll split it out and we'll split by this column that we made and we'll group by paper. And so now I don't even need this grouping column anymore. And this is exactly what we wanted, okay? If I, if I take a look at column three, that's where the authors start. And let's look as we go along, some papers have more authors than others. Okay, it looks like the highest number was eight. So that's six authors. We can combine all those. That's what we wanted. We didn't want to lose any authors. We want them all in a single column. So we're going to highlight all of these columns with a shift. So try to highlight them all with a shift and drag. There we go. And we're just going to use our columns utilities right here. Columns, utilities, and combine those columns. And now you'll see that in between column two and column three, I have an author's column. Columns three through eight are still selected in the table. So I'm just gonna hit the delete key and they're gone. So now I have exactly what I want. I just need to do a little more cleanup and it's pretty easy to do. I'll go through, call this first column session then title. Uh, this is topic and I've got level here, abstract. Okay, so that's all looking good. And, and finally, I can just come through and as, as a one last thing, I can do a recoding here. And so I'll just, I'll recode on all of these things and I'll do these in place. So for this first one, I'll collapse the white space again. And now that we've done that, I can come along and do the first word. If I want to get rid of that first word, that's in the advanced section. You can say, I want everything but the first word. 
Okay, that's cleaned up. Do the same thing here. All but first word. Do it here. And finally, we'll just do another collapsing of white space just to be vigilant. All right, and that's it. Okay, we got exactly what we wanted. With no scripting, no formulas, not any that we had to make anyway. So there's a lot you can do here to um, you know, clean up nasty data. And this, this will not be the last time we talk about cumulative sums on the, on the doctor. So that's all I've got for today. I hope that helps you. I hope this can help you with your data cleanup. And uh, back to Julian. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Brady. And uh, that recording will be on the community as all the recordings are for the different sessions. So I invite you to go watch that on-demand session uh, if you want to see in real specific detail everything Brady did. And Brady, I hope you'll share the data sets and the journal that you built for that uh, so our users can try that out. Uh, one thing you may have noticed with Brady is that Watching him is sort of like watching a master painter work with all the different tools that he has at his disposal. But um, I just want you all to know that, you know, once you learn all these different pieces of jump, uh, you can achieve essentially what Brady achieves. It's not, it's not something you can't get to. Uh, he is exceptional, but, you know, jump really enables you to do a lot of these things really efficiently. So our next segment is going to be a Have You Tried, where Ryan's going to take us through a very neat thing in jump you may not have tried before, which is virtual joins. Virtual joins in Jump have been improved, allowing a single column to be used as a key and a reference, and we've added new hover tips to determine a link column source table. Additionally, with virtual joins, when one of a link set of tables is opened, the others can be automatically opened as well. I'll demo this with the sample data table in Jump called Employee Masters which is already set up to join two other reference tables. The two other tables will automatically be hidden when I open the parent data table. I'll go to the home window and select the other two tables to make them visible. You can also go to the window menu and then choose hidden. In each of these three data tables, we're using the employee ID column for the link ID and using the link reference to connect the data tables. We can right click that column and toggle on or off the link ID. Then we'll reference education history from the parent data table, employee masters. And in that education history data table, we'll reference the third data table, prediction termination. So now when we open our parent data table, employee masters, it has virtually joined all three tables because it includes all of the other reference data tables, like links in a chain. If we want to automatically open the reference data table, when we launch the parent data table, we can right click the column, select column info, then under link reference, select auto open. You can try multi-table virtual join and jump now by using the employee master sample data. Outstanding. Thanks so much, Ryan. And if you haven't tried virtual joins, it's certainly worth looking into. Uh, the memory savings are pretty impressive as well. So if you have very long linked tables and you're joining them against smaller uh, master tables, you'll save a lot on memory by not having to do the full join itself. So definitely check out virtual joins. Our next talk is by Mary and Ruth, and this is one I'm excited to share with you all. This is their talk called Which Model Win? And some of you actually may have seen this if you had uh, joined us at Discovery. And so I'm excited to have them on air to talk about which model win. Oh, Ruth, you want to ask? There we go. I think I'm sharing my screen. And I will start this. So hi, Mary. Hey, Ruth. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. You ready Glad for which model when? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Ruth Hummel. I work um, as a technical person helping out people in the academic area. And Mary is a manager of folks like me for a lot of the United States. Um, so we get questions a lot from people about which model should I use? How do I decide which model to use? And I'm going to warn you now, we're not going to answer all your questions in 20 minutes. But what we will focus on in the next 20, 25 minutes is the idea that when you're asking what model to use, you really need to start by asking, what are you trying to do? What is your goal? What, what are you trying to accomplish in your data analysis? So to kind of motivate some things as we talk about this, we're gonna mostly stick with this example about housing prices. So we have a data set, we have information like the price of a home, and we have other information about features of that home, like the number of bedrooms in that home, the number of bathrooms, the lot size, the year it was built, and so on. Well, Ruth, so Ruth and I, uh, we think about what model, what's your goal, what are the questions you're trying to answer? And so we put up these four quadrants, not to have you guess, but to kind of guide you along in our thinking and how we break out the information based on the questions that you want your data to tell you. Um, so once again, what is the goal of your modeling? So the first one that Ruth handily put up for me <laughs> is segment, a segment known as segmentation, known as clustering. Um, and it's just a way to group information, like things, similar things. And we take a look at that to find out um, behavior. We're looking to see who might be wanting to purchase and see if there's similarities in that purchase. So segmentation, clustering, you might hear us mostly refer to it as clustering because that's what we have in JUMP. And the second quadrant that we're going to, so we're focusing on four big areas. There's lots of goals you might have outside of this, but some four main areas. The second of our main areas is explaining. You might need to explain a relationship. Oh, I should tuck these guys away, shouldn't I? You're all seeing this. You might need to explain a relationship where you specifically want like the mathematical formula so that you can pull out those numbers, those estimates and interpret them. For example, you might want to know how much should you expect to pay for an extra bedroom in a home. So what you, you'd be fitting a, a slope to that and you'd pull out that slope and interpret that number as how much an extra bedroom costs when you're determining house price. Predict. So um, this is uh, what you, if you want to use existing data to predict a future outcome, right? So you might be interested in and in predicting a uh, housing price, right? So you might, you think about, I want a three bedroom house, I want five bathrooms, so when company comes, and I want a huge lot for my dog, so, and I want it in this neighborhood, so I want to predict the outcome. Could I afford a home like that? What would the price be? Um, for that home. So this is the area where we want to predict. And our fourth quadrant here is the idea of identifying, that you don't care as much about explaining the relationship or predicting an outcome, but you care more about identifying which factors are important. You might care about this when you have to keep collecting that information and you'd like to know what you could stop collecting and still get a good predictive model. So for example, which of the many characteristics of a house uh, are important to whether the house gets an offer. So if, our, if we're trying to predict offer, which variables are important in that prediction process? So you might have multiple goals or you might iterate between them all and you probably touch all four quadrants, but we felt today was the best way to kind of break up the information that we wanted to share with you about which model when. Awesome, so hey Mary, you wanna play a game? Oh yeah, you know I love games. <laughs> I do know that. Okay, so analysis number one, we would like to identify which features of a home are the most important to determining the price. So if I am a new housing price website, um, so I'm going to collect information from MLS listings and I'm going to go out and look at homes and take pictures and put this stuff on my website, what's the important information that I need to include in my website so that I can build good pricing models? For example, maybe I would like to find out that square footage and the number of bathrooms is the, those are the two most important factors. So we might want to get something like what this little picture of column contributions is showing us, the idea that square footage explains a lot of what's going on with price and bathrooms explains a lot more and then everything else is kind of diminishing returns. So Mary, which type of, which quadrant, what kind of goal do you think we have here? Mm, which goal, huh? 
I think, um, I think, column contributions, square footage, number of bathrooms, important factors. I think you're right. I think we're looking for important factors. So for in our vocabulary here, we called that the identify goal. Identifying important Oh, identify. Factors. Yeah, exactly. That. <laughs> <laughs> so you, like you get a 50% on that one. Okay. I'll take <laughs> so it. We're trying to identify the important factors with this goal. Yeah, we're kind of in the process making a, a prediction equation, possibly that might be part of our goal. So we might have a secondary goal here as well. But our, what we're really asking for here is identifying which factors are important. So there's three tools that we wanna recommend in Jump if this is your goal or one of your goals. One is from the analyze menu, the screening option and predictor screening. Predictor screening will actually run a bootstrap forest and give you this column contributions kind of idea. Another option is to just run the bootstrap forest from the predictive modeling option under analyze. And a third option is to use the analyze fit model and the generalized regression personality because you get a slightly different sort of answer to which factors to include there. You could also try stepwise selection as another option. So if you use the predictor screening, you're gonna get something like this top left corner output, which is saying, here's the rank. This is what's most important. Square footage is most important. Baz is next most important. We see something really similar from the bootstrap forest output. Again, square footage, super important. Baths, pretty important. And then things lower than that are ranked lower. If we use generalized regression, we're actually, instead of focusing on those full factors where we can put things like two-way interactions and three-way interactions in the model. So the predictor screening and, call and bootstrap forest, they are considering nonlinear relationships. They're letting us have lots of splits in lots of different places. But generalized regression ties back more to a regression framework where we might build the model with interaction effects. So here we can actually narrow down even from interaction effects. So again, we're seeing the same kind of concept. The generalized regression also tells us square footage is really important baths is really important and so on <laughs> all right ready ruth so we want to build a model to predict housing prices based on any other important predictor variables we have in our data for example we want to get the predicted price when we input the specifics for the house well, I got an easy one because we wrote the word predicted in here about a thousand times. So I want to make sure I left, left breadcrumbs for you, Ruth. <laughs> I'm going to guess this is a predicted goal. Yes, it is. Okay, awesome. So with the predictions, you know, under the analyze predictive modeling, we have partition, our tree methods, and of course, neural nets. And, um, and we can't leave out generalized regression, but here we are, here's the dialog boxes, and we're looking at, we wanna predict price, right? So we wanna look at what I really want with beds, bath, lot size, and years built. Um, I wanna know if I can figure out the price, and can I afford that with that combination? So we have the bootstrap forest, which is um, sort of as a tree method that we build trees based on, um, as like a model averaging, it's with replacement. And then we have the fit model generalized regression, which we use to do the random sampling. Um, and it also can handle the correlated uh, variables. Let's look at generalized regression lasso. And um, we find with that, that that's, a pro prediction, uh, that's our prediction profiler. And if you bring up the other one, Ruth. And that's the prediction profiler for the bootstrap force. And what those kind of tell us is it tells us um, the allows us to, you know, basically turn the dials and see the region or the areas where in combination what the prices might be to predict. So if I had the opportunity to move to lot size and pick the largest lot size and I wanted to be in the suburbs and I wanted five bedrooms, um, and I want at least 4,500 square feet, I think my prediction would be that I couldn't afford it. <laughs> and when you, when you get to run these models, um, uh, like bootstrap and generalized regression, you, we, we have the ability to compare them. And what's kind of neat here with the model comparison is I can take all the models that I've run and I can look at them and see them in a tabular output. And the key thing, 
um, is the is I want to look at the R square, and that's percent of variation of price explained by our model. And then we have two other variable, um, two other um, results, which is RASE and AAE, which is our error terms. And we want them to be small, and we always want our R square to be large. So if we look at this table, you can see here that the neural net, uh, which I chose to run, is the best one. Uh, or the best model for this particular situation. Now from model comparison, which I think is awesome, Ruth said that you know she's really into C code and she would like to have this model scoring in C code. So if I go through model comparison and bring up the formula depot, I can save this modeling score code in C and then I can make Ruth happy. Thank you, Mary. You've made me very happy. One, <laughs> one other thing I want to point out here, because yep. we're talking about which model to choose, we're not focusing really closely on how to select within this set of possible predictive models. But comparing between the bootstrap forest and the generalized regression with the lasso, you can kind of see some of the reasons you might choose one or over the other as far as output. So the lasso, that regression based model, you can see those straight line sort of effects of right. bathrooms and lot size and year built. And if we put in more interactions, certainly we can get curvature to those, but we're gonna get that regression style output. For the bootstrap forest, we can actually capture all kinds of nonlinearity. So if you want to be able to interpret also, in addition to the predictive model, interpret the coefficients, the generalized regression is gonna give you that extra benefit. If you wanna be able to capture all kinds of regions of nonlinearity, a, a tree-based method might be your better choice. So here's another point about how to choose within the predictive modeling. Good point, Ruth, good point. Thanks, Mary. Okay, analysis number three. We want to quantify the effect of home prices on home prices from additional bedrooms. So that idea of how much should I expect to pay for an extra bedroom? I'm home shopping. I see two homes in a sim similar area, lots of similarities between them, similar square footage, similar lot size, but one has an extra bedroom. So how much should I expect to pay extra? And so maybe I'll find that every additional bedroom adds $97,644 to the total home cost. Now, I'll tell you, I'm super interested in housing data, which is why we're using this as an example. I've looked at housing data from lots of different cities. I live in Orlando, Florida. In Orlando, that this estimate is actually closer to about $20,000. So you should expect to pay about $20,000 extra for an extra bedroom. This estimate of 97,644 is from Cincinnati. So just in case you were curious, if you live in Cincinnati, expect an extra $100,000 per bedroom. Oh, it's got to be more than that for Boston, where I live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, some of the reason for the lower price in Orlando is because homes are cheaper here. Come get it. <laughs> uh, okay, so Mary, it's, it's on you. Which, which type of, uh, which quadrant are we in here? Oh, uh, man, this is a tough one, Ruth. You didn't leave me any breadcrumbs, so I'm going to say explain. You want to explain. I agree with you. So again, there's some overlap between predictive models and explanation models, but we're talking about the emphasis being on, do you want to predict really well where our metrics are about how well we predict, or do we want to explain using slopes and, and estimates in the model to see a meaning associating the factor to the response? So explanation is exactly right in this case. So we're going to be in the analyze menu in the fit model options for the explanation type models, the regression kinds of models. Standard least squares is the default if you've got something continuous like home price that you're modeling. And so that's going to be ANOVAs and regressions and that style of analysis. If we had something categorical that we were predicting, like if we wanted to predict getting an offer on the home versus not getting an offer, it would default to logistic regression for that. Or we could switch over to generalized regression again for more options. So we could combine the identify factors with the, the modeling in the generalized regression. So in this case, because we've got a continuous home price as our response and we've got something continuous we're predicting with a slope, we're actually doing a regression. You don't even have to know that to use jump. You just use this personality of standard least squares for any of those options. So here, if I fill out price as the response, the number of bedrooms as the effect, either alone or with lots of other variables, but that's the one that I'm focusing on, so I might want to pull out that one slope at the end. I can either use that default standard least squares personality, or I can switch over to generalized regression. All right, so Ruth, can we conclude that like generalized regression is a uh, one stop? 
I think for we many can. things. I think we can. Um, for any of you watching that haven't used generalized regression before, generalized regression is only available in Jump Pro. So we're trying to give you options that don't use that as well. But yeah, I think Mary, it's a pretty good tool. Great, great. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Number four. So far, you're ahead of me because I'm a half a half a point behind. <laughs> All right, we, we want to identify them. groups of home group of home that are similar, similarly based on a list of possible characteristics. For example, we want to identify market segments, home listings um, from a database that might have certain segments or characteristics that are similar or grouping that we want to look at. So what's your call? Well, again, you gave me lots of breadcrumbs. So I see the word <laughs> segment in here. So I think we're doing that segmentation, that, mar that finding things that are similar across lots of variables, no response variable in mind. Um, so I think we're in the clustering. Ding, 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 ding. Yes, yes. So um, the clustering menu in Jump is under the analyze and we have um, various methods, different algorithms for clustering. And this um, one we're going to talk about today is hierarchical clustering. We also could use the multivariate method if we chose to. All right, so basically, I'm just going to put the variables in that are characteristics of the home that I'm interested in or want to see the relationship to uh, these variables and similarities. And we come out with the output of the uh, clustering platform. And on my left here, um, which I hope is your left, uh, is the dendrogram. And it shows us how things have been grouped together. We don't have the labels on here, but you can see there's probably six clusters, different colors, so we can begin to look at certain similarities that are grouped together. To the right is another way, it's a parallel plot. And what that's giving us, every single line is a home um, in that, that's being represented. So we have a lot of um, homes. And the way that you look at the parallel plot is the, the lower on the y-axis, if you want, is the lowest. And then the top of the y-axis um, is the highest. So it goes low to high. And if we look across, it's another you know way to look at this hierarchical data. And I thought the one that kind of caught my eye was cluster three. And I looked at years, year built, and that's pretty high. And I thought, geez, that must be newer homes, right? And um, I looked at cluster two, and that one's, I looked at year built, and I said, that must be older homes. So you can go across and look at the relationship of each home and how it's represented in each cluster across the characteristics that you chose to um, compare or group together. Yeah, and if, if we were doing this with some kind of market segmentation, so not looking at homes that were similar, but like people's buying behaviors that are similar, we'd maybe see how likely they are to buy certain products or um, how often they shop at certain stores. So that would help us see, oh, these are the people who really love grocery shopping, but don't do any clothes shopping, something like that. So we'd be able to identify what, what these market segments are popping out. Patterns, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in conclusion, you know, we said we had our four quadrants. What's your goal? What's your, what are you going after? What kind of information are you trying to extract? So we have segmentation or clustering, which we shared with you. And that's um, once again, grouping. Yeah, and, and the fit model platforms that we talked about for the explain goal were the standard least squares, logistic regression and, and generalized regression. Again, those are the personalities within that fit model platform that we suggested for that explain goal where you want to actually interpret those coefficients. And the predict or predictive modeling is using tree methods, partition, uh, random forest, boosted trees, and of course, neural nets, um, which is our black box approach that gives us lots of really good information. And um, of course, you know, for the backseat driver, GenReg can always play in this predictive area. Yeah, absolutely. And then for the identify goal, we mentioned three different platforms. Just a quick pass, predictor screening is a really good tool. So that just tells you yeah. what things are very important. Again, it's using a bootstrap forest in the background. So another option is to go to the predictive modeling bootstrap forest or to the fit model platform and use that generalized regression or possibly stepwise selection if you want to 
um, sort of select out things like two-way interactions and three-way interactions that aren't important. Well, great. Well, this is um, uh, which model when? <laughs> yeah, we've got still about five more minutes if anyone has any questions, questions. Like to ask. Um, so Julian, if you'd like to um, let us know if there's any questions, we've got two hidden examples that we can pull up while we're waiting for questions. Or we can take some questions, whatever you prefer, Julian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can uh, give a two minute pause if you like and let people ask questions. Or if you prefer, you can talk through some things while people are asking questions. Do you have a preference? Um, how, Mary, let's go through one extra example while we let people get their questions in and then we'll take questions. All right. Okay. This so, is a tiebreaker. <laughs> yeah, we're not prepared for this. Um, so Mary, All right. ask me. All right. Go for it. Okay. I, this is your chance to win back your points if you... Um, if oh, you I got a guess right though. Yeah, okay. All right. So we want to know how home prices might differ based on their location. So we have three locations, city, rural, and suburban, and we want to find out something like how much is the difference on average. So for example, right, being right downtown in the city is $20,000 more expensive than in the rural community. So we wanna actually get that estimate and be able to interpret that estimate. So which scenario do you think? Oh, we wanna interpret, huh? It's difference based on their location. Predict. So we are gonna be predicting home prices, but I tried to write this question in the, the perspective of where the goal is interpreting the actual estimates. So I was aiming for the explanation goal. Here. Explanation. Well, I guess you're going to give me that one. <laughs> I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, a half a point here, half a point there. You're still yeah. two points um, to my right. two. Points. So and you're right. It is, an, it, it is explaining. Yeah. And again, as we mentioned, you, there's a lot of interplay between these things. You might have multiple goals. Yep. But if you really want to be able to pull out those coefficients and interpret those, then those uh, statistical based models like ANOVA and regression, those types of things are going to be good tools for you. Julian, do we have any questions? Yeah, one came in. Uh, where did you acquire your residential home data set? Great question. Go ahead, Ruth. You're the, you're the, you're the, the guru on this. Well, I'm not. So I joined Jump about four years ago and was so fortunate to join a team with Julian Paris, who is hosting us, and Mia Stevens, who has certainly been on broadcasts um, in this past week talking about STIPS. Um, two fantastic people. And I saw them give a talk about using housing data probably four years ago. Um, they're the ones who passed this on to me, but redfin.com is right. easy to scrape data from. So if you do want housing data and you want to grab this and analyze it yourself, if you've got if you're in a U.S. city, um, redfin.com will give you easy access to download data for a U.S. city. And I remember a Jump Discover talk that Julian gave using Redfin and did mapping and did all kinds of exploratory data visualization using the Redfin data. And I was just like awestruck. And then with Mia, when they were putting in the casino in Boston, we looked at the the area around Boston to see where we should invest. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, very cool. Julian, any other questions for us? Uh, yeah, here's one. Do you have a rule of thumb on dealing with the magnitude of random error compared with the prediction results? Hmm. I would think that's um, an, a personal preference, right? Choosing what information you want to what the question you're asking and what you're uh, willing to accept. Yeah, I don't have a rule of thumb. If somebody else does uh, that wants to post something in the, the questions, you're welcome yep. to. But it's going to have to do with what you're comfortable with, like what amount of risk you're allowing. Right. In your, so here's some output from, for example, the, the model comparison. Um, the R squared is our first fit statistic there that just tells us how much variation we're explaining based on the factors we're putting in our model, that RASE and AAE are telling us essentially the average error. So this is where you, if you had a rule of thumb, you could apply that rule of thumb, but it's going to be very specific to your scenario, sort of like R squared criteria are specific to your scenario. If you've got experimental data where you can control a lot of it, then you expect to be able to fit it really well with very little extra error. Um, so R squares of 0.99 are, are reasonable in that scenario. Whereas if you have just observational data and there's a lot of sources of variation that you can't control, you're going to expect a much higher amount of error 
Um, so this R squared of 0.7 is actually pretty good in an observational data scenario. So I don't have a rule of thumb for you. I think it's going to have to do with your specific how comfortable you are um, with those prediction intervals. But if you use the generalized regression, you actually get those mean confidence. Yeah, right. was... so that's one place where you can see, am I comfortable with this? Is this where I'm okay? Um, so sorry, I, I don't have a rule of thumb, but um, it kind of is scenario specific. Yeah, it's more subjective. Okay, Julian. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> there are uh, a few extra questions, but we'll defer those till the community. But uh, thank right. you so much, Mary and Ruth, for your presentation. Wonderful. Well, well thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Ruth, and uh, thanks for letting me win. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. In our next section, uh, we have Lisa Hunt-Lauer, who's going to take us through today's bite-sized tips and knowledge about statistical methods. And lucky for us, it's linear regression, which Mary and Ruth just talked to us about within their explained goal. So this is today's stat snack. Thanks, Julian. Again, my name is Elisa hunt -Lowry. I'm a systems engineer here at JUMP, and today's stat snack is linear regression. So what is linear regression? It's a statistical tool used to relate two variables. And here I have a simple graph that denotes Y, the output, and X as an input. For linear regression, both these variables should be continuous or numeric, meaning it's measured with a device. So what does that look like graphically? Here, I have four graphs or scatter plots, and you can see a relationship, a linear relationship among three of the graphs. And then the bottom left-hand corner, you see a curvilinear relationship between those variables. Linear regression can be used in explanatory modeling. Explanatory modeling is where you look at inputs to see if there's a relationship with the output. We can also use regression to make predictions. And for the rest of our time today, I'm gonna to focus on simple linear regression. Simple linear regression is when you have one output or Y and one input or one X. To make predictions, we must use an equation to relate those two variables. You can see an equation on your screen, Y equals beta naught plus beta one times X, where beta naught represents the, the intercept or where the line crosses over the y-axis, and beta one represents the slope of the line. This equation can help us answer questions like, is temperature a predictor of yield? And also, if I wanna optimize yield, what does the temperature need to be? This technique uses something called ordinary least squares regression, which looks at the difference between the actual or measured value and a predicted value. This difference is called the residual or error. What happens if we start adding up those errors? The sum will be zero, and this method of least squares regression finds the smallest error by coming up with the best intercept and best slope that fits the line. Let's talk more about sum of squares which by the way, is describing variation. And remember, variances add, and there are two pieces to sum of squares total. Sum of squares from the model, which is the variation explained by the model, and then sum of square error, which is the unexplained variation. And you can also see a graphical picture of sum of squares over on the left. An important characteristic of linear regression is the R squared value. The R squared value is the coefficient of determination. And this is the percent of variation explained by the output by the model. If we have a low R squared, then perhaps we haven't captured the right predictor. Now, let's look at an example. A chemical manufacturer wants to determine if there's a relationship between temperature and yield. So we look at the data, and of course we use Jump, and we use the Fit Y by X platform, and we get a scatter plot, and then we fit a line. 
both these variables are continuous. And once we fit a line, Jump has now given us an equation to tell us what that relationship is between yield and temperature. So we can see that the intercept is 99.6. We can see that the slope of the line is negative because as temperature increases, yield decreases. And it also gives us an R squared value of 92.4%, letting us know that 92.4% of the variation in yield is explained by temperature. So we can use this information to determine how to optimize yield. So what does the temperature setting need to be? Clearly, the temperature setting should be low in order to maximize yield. That's all the time I have for today. And if you would like to learn more about linear regression, please check out the statistics knowledge portal on the JUMP website. Great. Thank you so much, Elisa. That was uh, really interesting and uh, certainly valuable. Linear regression being one of these very often used techniques and to understand a little bit more of the math is always good. So thank you so much. In our next section, we have a jump in action for you on a really interesting topic, functional design of experiments, which systems engineer Ross Matuslam is going to tell us about. Hi everybody, it's Ross here, systems engineer coming to you from Tampa, Florida. And as Julian said, in this segment, we're gonna talk about functional design of experiments, which generally is the situation in which you're conducting an experiment and your response variable takes the form of a curve instead of a single value. So let's unpack that idea a little bit. In essence, when we're doing functional design of experiments or FDOE, we're asking how factors of interest affect the features of a curve that we care about. For example, we might have a load deflection curve. So here on the x-axis, we have the load placed on a surface, and on the y-axis, we have the deflection that we measure. We see three different curves for three different widths of a material, and we might be interested in how the material's width or some other property of the material actually affects the shape of this curve. Here we have a reflectance curve for various types of mirror coatings. So on the x-axis now we have the wavelength of light and on the y-axis we have the percent of light reflected uh, at those varying wavelengths. We might be interested in how different uh, aspects of mirror coatings affect this curve, maybe because we're trying to achieve a certain ideal curve. Or third example, one actually from research that I've done in the past as a cognitive scientist uh, using sensor data, in particular EEG or brain waves, voltages measured over time uh, generated by the brain. We might be interested in how the type of stimulus we show someone actually affects the shape of the EEG curve we mentioned. And, uh, you know, sensor data actually is probably a really prominent application area for this type of thing. A lot of us deal with sensor data, whether it be voltage over time, like we have here, or temperature over time, pH over time, and so forth. But in all these examples, we're just interested in how some factor of interest actually affects this curve and its shape or its features. So the example we're going to talk about right now is uh, milling pigment particles for manufacturing LCD screens. So we start with our raw pigment and we put it into a bead mill depicted on the left here. And we have various factors uh, that we can control uh, with respect to the milling process, for example, the flow rate or the temperature. And we're interested in how these factors affect the shape of the curves that we see on the right. So you see in these curves where we have time on the x-axis and the size of the pigment on the y, uh, we see a generally speaking, a pretty rapid decrease in uh, particle size at first once we start the milling, and then it starts to level off a bit. In green, we see the specification range, so that's where we want to stop. Now, we really care about the shape of the curves here. You know, we, we don't want to spend too much time milling, so we want to see a, a steep drop-off at first so that we can get into that green range as fast as we can, but we also don't want to overmill. So we want to see a nice steady kind of asymptote within that green range so that if we happen to leave the mill running a little bit longer, we don't actually overshoot and end up with particles too small. So this is a great time to use DOE, right? We want to know how we can basically optimize this response variable, these curves, by manipulating our factors. So we would first use JUMP's DOE tools to figure out how to systematically manipulate the factors. Then we would actually record the curves uh, across multiple runs or batches of pigment. 
And then finally, we would model the relationship between the two. All of this is just the basic DOE process. So here, uh, we have an equation that looks much like the one Elisa just showed us. This is just capturing the relationship between temperature and the curve. So we have some intercept plus temperature times some slope coefficient equals. And if you're with me now, it's you know something about the curve's shape, right? But what do, how do we get the curve's shape into this equation. That's kind of the big challenge that we're dealing with here in FDOE. We need the, uh, the measure here to be a single value. So the question is, what do we measure? Well, if we're really concerned about just getting to spec as fast as we can, maybe we just measure the time at which we hit spec. But that doesn't really tell us if we get that nice asymptote to make sure we stay in spec. So maybe we see if, you know, what the size of the particles is when we see that the decrease in size has leveled off. Whatever leveled off means, we would have to operationalize that to maybe okay measures, you know, somewhat imperfect and certainly don't capture the shape of this curve. Maybe we actually instead regress size on time using something like a quadratic model and then enter those coefficients in as the you know, quote unquote curve shape. Maybe that would do better, maybe not. You can see none of these uh, solutions are ideal. So what we really want is a better way to actually capture the shape of the curve in a single value. And that's what Jump Pro's Functional Data Explorer can do for us. It, in essence, finds the primary uh, features or shapes in a curve and translates them into single values. The basic idea is this, we take our data, we fit a model to the data, and then that model represents each curve as some average shape on the left center there, plus or minus some amount of some primary shape feature, or in technical terms, a, a functional principal component. And from that model, then we pull out uh, these shape feature scores, or where it says FPC1, these functional principal component scores. And these actually capture, for this case, uh, the batches in our experiment, uh, you know, how much of that primary shape feature we would add in or out to approximate that shape. And so in this way, we can actually kind of stay true to the shapes of our curves and still enter them into analysis techniques like linear regression. So this is all in static images. It's kind of hard to understand or visualize, especially if you've never really encountered this idea before. So now I want to switch over to jump to kind of show you how it all works. So let's bring a data set in. Here's a data set from the uh, experiment where we manipulated our factors. So once again, these four variables here, and then we measured across multiple batches uh, the size at various times. So the first eight rows here represent the measurements taken from batch 2887. Just to show you, I've also included down at the bottom here an ideal curve. If you remember, I said we kind of wanted to get down to spec really fast, but then just stay there. So this curve, as we're about to see, actually just kind of captures that ideal state for us. What I'm going to do now is show you the end result of the analysis, just uh, so that you can kind of get an idea of where we're going. And then I'll run back through and show you how to produce it uh, using tools and jump. So here's the output of the analysis in Jump's Functional Data Explorer. This is in Jump Pro. Let me walk you through what we have here, the basic elements. Up in the left side, we have each of our batches. You can see them numbered there. And Jump has fit a flexible curve to each one uh, shown in red. It's using something called a spline model, which you can find more information on on the right. For example, we have a one knot cubic model, as you can see here. We then use that model to perform something called functional principal components analysis, which is what actually captures the average shape and this primary shape component. So we see our average shape of those curves here and this one uh, component shape that actually explains 99% of the variability in uh, all of the shapes of our curves across all of our batches. Down here in the score plot, we can actually see for uh, individual batches that either have a lot of that shape on the right side or actually subtract out a lot of that shape on the left, kind of what they look like. So if we look at 2899, I'll just pin this here. You can see it says it has a component score of 77, so we're adding in a fair bit of this shape. And you can see it doesn't look so great. It's not exactly what we would want to see. We don't have a really steep drop off, and this is kind of a nice level trend down that doesn't asymptote like we would want. So we can actually kind of explore that a little further down here. 
we have a profiler that allows us to see on the left panel the shape of the curve that we get out of the model um, given a certain value of this shape component on the right side. So let's go ahead and actually add some of that shape component in. And you can see that the shape on the left is actually changing. And as we get to a pretty high value, you can see that the model's shape actually starts to look an awful lot like 2899. In fact, 2899 has a component score of 77. So I could go ahead and just enter that in there. And now we can see that the model's shape actually looks very much like the shape we observed. Conversely, if we go all the way down to uh, batch 2887, this is one that has a pretty negative shape score, negative 83. And you can see the shape is a fair bit different. It actually looks a lot better. It drops off fast and then kind of levels off. If we enter negative 83 as our score, you can see that once again, the model has captured that. Now we have a shape that looks an awful lot like what we observed for 2887. So these scores, the 77 and negative 83, these are single values that actually capture a complex uh, variation in the shapes that we saw across all the batches that we run. So now we have single scores that we can actually enter into an analysis in a way that then allows us to kind of model the shape of our curves um, with kind of a, a greater degree of fidelity. And that's what we do down here where it says functional DOE analysis. Remember, our goal is to actually see how changes in our factors affect the shape of the curve. Jump has used Pro's generalized regression platform to automatically fit a model for us that relates our factors to the uh, FPC scores or those shape scores that we were looking at. And we can see, for example, as I increase the percent beads, we start to get a shape that looks a little more like the one we're after. As I increase percent strength, again, we start to see a slight improvement in shape. Just like you might have seen elsewhere in Jump, we can even ask to maximize the desirability. That is to find the factor settings that get as close to our target as possible. And so here we can see these factor settings down below give us a curve that starts to look pretty good. We have a nice steep drop off and then it levels off right here. So that's functional DOE in a nutshell. You have your factors of interest, you let jump extract shape features, and then you just relate your factors of interest to those shape features and even uh, optimize by finding a set of uh, factor settings that yield the shape closest to the one that you want. So now in the last few minutes, I just wanna walk you through kind of how all this works. So if you wanna try this out yourself, you know where to go. So let me close this down. First, you may be wondering, well, how did we actually design an experiment? These were experimental data. It was actually from a definitive screening design. Uh, this is fairly straightforward. Under the DOE menu, you'll find our normal DOE tools. I'll go to definitive screening here. And in Jump Pro 15, under the responses, you're now going to see a functional response type. So I'll go ahead and choose that. I'll actually remove this other response, this non-functional response. You can see we can enter the name just like we would. Otherwise, we can set the number of measures per run. I'll just leave it at five for now. And this is flexible. You could add or remove measures per run as you um, go along in conducting your experiment. Then we enter our factors as we normally would. Here I have a table representing those factor settings just to speed things up. So I'll go ahead and load those factors in. Click continue. And then I'll keep the standard design options for the DSD and just click make design. We have our design out and now I'll make the table. So this is a jump DOE table. We see places to record size. I'd only specified five, so I get them. So you can see each uh, row here represents one function, but you can go ahead and if you want, maybe use tables stack as we had done to put this in a tall format, which then would allow you to create a time column and keep track of which time you took the uh, measurements and so forth. You also see just like with uh, any other DOE table that you get out of Jump, you have your built-in scripts to pull up the design window again or conduct your analyses and so forth. So nothing too big there. You just make sure to specify your functional response type. Now let's actually take a look at uh, the Functional Data Explorer platform and how we use it to analyze the data. So you'll find Functional Data Explorer under Specialized Modeling. Functional Data Explorer. 
I'm in this stacked or tall format, though you can enter data in other formats. For example, rows as functions would correspond to the format that we got out of uh, the DSD platform. These first two fields here, X and Y, just refer to the variables that define our function. So ours was size across time, so I'll put size is Y, time is X. Because we're in this stacked format, jump needs to know which row belongs to which experimental run or which batch. So I'll go ahead and just put batch in as the ID. And then I'll grab our experimental factors and put them in the Z supplementary role so that they get passed along to Functional Data Explorer. Here's our window. You can see it looks similar to what we had before. Our data have all been loaded in. In the green stars here is actually the target function that I had loaded previously, which you can see down here with the nice steep drop off and then the asymptote. So right now Jump is treating that as uh, actual data, which it's not. So we wanna make sure to tell Jump that that's actually the target function. I'll click load and then say that the one that I've labeled target is our target. You can see it's removed here from the plot and kind of broken out down below. There are a lot of options you're probably noticing on the right here for uh, processing the data, cleanup, transformation, and so forth. We don't have any of that to do here. So what we'll do next is actually fit the curves to the data or the spline model. Here we have a few different classes of models we can use. I'll choose B splines. We have curves fit to each of our experimental runs and the functional PCA that extracts that shape component has been done for us. Once again, just this one shape component explains 99% of the variability, so we don't really need another shape component. But in other data sets, you might get multiple shape components out. We have, again, our score plot and our profiler that allows us to see how changes in these uh, FPC scores affect the shape. And when I'm ready to go, I'll just go next to the model title here and request the functional DOE analysis. And now down below, I have the profiler that relates our factor settings to the shape of the curve. And once again, this was done using Jump Pro's generalized regression. And I can actually modify the model or look into the model's details further uh, right here. So I can go ahead and open this up and for example, uh, maybe launch another type of model or if I care to, even view some of the reports, for example, the parameter estimates. So you're not stuck with whichever model is first chosen. You can, in fact, kind of work with the model to get one that you're satisfied with. So that's functional DOE in 15 minutes. The take home message, you have factors that you wanna to relate to the shape of a curve. Under the DOE menu, you can create your design with a functional response type and then analyze your data in Functional Data Explorer by first fitting the curves to the data, then performing the functional principal components analysis, and then finally uh, requesting the functional DOE analysis. So a pretty sophisticated uh, technique here available in a nice, easy to use package. Um, you know, this is a deep topic though. So if you're looking for more information, I encourage you to head on over to the Jump On Air space on the user community, where for uh, the page for this, presentation, you'll find links to some more helpful info. So that's all for me. Thanks for your attention, uh, Julie, and I'll pass it back to you. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Ross. And yeah, just a reminder to head over to the community space for this episode. And uh, Ross will have posted more additional materials on functional design of experiments. Thanks so much, Ross. To finish us off, we have Pete and Mary back to act out scenes where a jump tip will actually help solve a real life problem. Welcome to Jump On Air's Tip of the Day. Today, Mary and I are gonna be walking through standardized attributes. Mary, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Pete, but I tell you, I'm a little frustrated bringing in that Excel file that I sent you because somehow where there should be numbers, I'm getting dots and I'm like, I'm going through trying to fix those one at a time and it's driving me nuts. Oh. So I, I hope you have an answer for me, Pete. I do. And uh, yeah, I do not want to drive you any more nuts than you already are, Mary. So <laughs> I'm going to share my screen. Are you seeing it? Yes, I am. Okay. And here is the Excel file that Mary sent me. Um, yep, that's it, it. I've got a bunch of numbers in here and uh, I, I can just go to this, this jump add in and uh, bring in 
uh, the, the Excel file that way, but I like to go to this uh, Excel import wizard and I can do that from a jump window, go file um, and open. And then I'm gonna just browse to that data that, that Mary sent me here and open it up. And now we get a preview of that, looks good. Let's go ahead and import this. And, oh, okay, I, I, I see. I get those, I get those, it becomes character data and I don't know why. Well, let's take a look. Why might that be, oh, okay. Oh, I told everybody not to do that. Wait till I have to send a little memo. Okay, I know I, I know you love your memos, Mary, but let's. Uh, I'll show you how to fix the problem right now. So you uh, hopefully not everyone gets yelled at. So, yeah, you see sometimes uh, data when it's a blank or there's a missing value, you get something like an NA. So jump right. assumes that all the data in that column is a character data and not ah. numeric. So let's yeah. just. I'll, I'll show you the quick and easy way to deal with this. I'm gonna highlight all, right. all of that data because everything in here should be numbers. That's what you told me, right? Right, 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 it should be. Okay, and so instead of going through and doing this one at a time, we're gonna go under the columns, standardize attributes, and now we have oh. options in here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna hit select all because I, I could recode all of these. In this uh, case, I just want to change right. all of these to numeric and continuous. Oh, and can you uh, fix the decimal place? So let's maybe do three yes. decimal places. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we know how Bob feels about all those extra decimals. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you think three's good? Um, well, what do you think? Three, let's do four. We can always reduce it down. Okay, we'll do four. And when I hit apply, you'll notice every column now has that numeric value in it and where those NAs are they're replaced with missing values. Wow. All right well thanks Pete this is awesome. You don't know how much time you saved me and now I can get home and I can walk the dog. Yeah and, and catch up on Tiger King too. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay well thanks Mary and this thanks, has been Pete your jump tip of the day. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pete and Mary. Uh, just a reminder to everyone to submit your tips to Pete and Mary to act out community.jump.com slash jump on air. In fact, we'd love it if you would uh, interact with us and engage with all of our speakers, presenters, and really all of us at Jump on Air at our community page. We'd love to hear show suggestions or really anything else about the show you would like to see more of. In addition, we would love it if you would follow us on our social media channels. We have a lot to share. And so if you stay in touch with us, we'll definitely stay in touch with you. Be sure to check out the program guide that you're going to be getting this weekend. We have a great set of speakers next week. Very excited about Jonah Berger, best-selling author, New York Times, uh, and Bradley Jones, our feature presenters of the week. So check out that guide when it comes out. Also, share us with a colleague. You can use that short URL, jump.com slash J-O-A, to share the uh, schedule page and the subscription page right with them. Make sure you join us Monday at 11 a.m. But really, until then, we hope you stay safe, we hope you stay healthy, and we hope you stay close, even as you're keeping your distance. Take care, everyone.